Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Amateur Radio General Class, session number 17. And we welcome you from Orlando, Florida. So we considering this session to be a hamcation edition of the Amateur Radio Classes. Also, today is Fantastic Friday. We have Carnival coming up Monday and Tuesday in Trinidad and Tobago. So we say greetings to everyone who is in TNT for Carnival. And also a special welcome to all of the persons who are participating in the session live at Hamcation in Orlando. During our previous session, we looked at what was the voluntary band plan. We also discussed minimum frequency separation for both operating modes, single sideband and CW. We discussed propagation changes uh, during a contact and frequency usage. We also talked about how hams assist others in emergencies. We discussed the function or the organization known as RACES. We also spoke about CD operate, CW operating procedures, how to select the speed as well as what is a zero beating. We also discussed signal reports when we're operating CW. And we also talked a bit about Q signals and pro signs when sending CW, and also the concept of full break-in telegraphy. We also introduced the volunteer monitoring program. And in respect of HF operations, we talked about maps that we use and what is long path contacts. And we also discussed calling CQ and the importance of identification in contests on HF. And we also again emphasized the importance and use of the phonetic alphabet. We also talked about what is CQDX, what it means and what is expected in terms of response, how to break into an existing conversation, and also how to give signal reports. Then we ended the theory by talking about what is QRP operation and the importance of maintaining a station log. We would have also dealt with the question pool review with all of the questions relating to the theory that we would have covered last session. So our agenda for this evening, we will look at digital modes and specifically what are the sub bands that are used for digital modes. We we'll talk about the importance of timing when we operate the digital mode known as FD8. Also, we will speak again about RITI and what the frequency shift is for that mode. Then we will also talk about, apart from frequency shift keying, we'll also introduce what is audio frequency shift keying and the selection between lower sideband and upper sideband. We'll talk about some other RITI configuration parameters in the software. Then we will introduce a couple of modes such as WinLink, discuss the mode VARA, and Pactor that's used for WinLink. And we will introduce a mesh network known as Arden or Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. And then uh, that will end that particular topic and we'll move on to safety and we'll be discussing RF safety and radiation exposure. We'll also talk about how do we evaluate the power limits to determine exposure. And then we'll go into some safe work practices such as the use of safe, safety harnesses as well as the lockout tagout procedure. And we will end the theory by talking about tower grounding safety. Of course, we will then proceed to do a question pool review, all of the questions related to the theory we would have covered this evening. All right. So just uh, for anyone who is now joining us on YouTube or persons at Hamcation that's uh, joining us in this session, we are presently doing the general class level which is essentially level two. There's a previous level known as the technician class in the FCC system. And on your screen are the links, should you choose or you would like to review the technician class material, as well as all of the handouts we would have provided during that course. So those are the links for you. That's the level one known as the technician class, but we are presently doing level two, which is the general class. Okay, so just to keep an eye on where we are in respect of the entire syllabus, so we, are pro we have progressed quite nicely in the course, and we are currently 
on the topic operating procedures we will finish off operating procedures this evening and we will begin electrical and RF safety so you would recognize after that we have just one more major topic which will be commission rules and that will bring us to the end of the tuition so we are quickly approaching the end just a reminder to all students that you should by now have begun to take practice exams it's never too early from day one you can start to take practice exams it gives you an idea where you are it gives you an idea of the types of questions in a real setting because the questions and the practice exams are taken for the from the exact same question pool that you will get in a live exam so therefore it pays to take these practice tests it will give you a pretty good idea as to where you are it will help build your confidence and once you're passing three and four of them you know handsomely you're doing 85 percent plus 90 percent you know you're getting really good scores above the minimum requirement then you know you're ready if not so much in between you know you need a little bit more work to study so that when you're ready to take the real exam you're almost sure to pass yeah all right so this is just a slide on Zello. Zello is a free walkie-talkie app. It works on almost any operating system, smartphone, tablet, PC, and it turns your device into a walkie-talkie type arrangement. So it's called Zello PTT or Zello Push to Talk. And for those who are interested in interacting with React, we have a channel called React Members. It's an open channel. You feel free to join. All communicators are welcome. And there are nets on Saturday nights at 9 p.m. as well as Monday nights at 9 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. More than welcome to join and participate. Right, so specifically, we are in the general class course or level two. And all of the documents that have been distributed so far such as the question pool, other supplementary material, part 97, as well as copies of all of these slides, the slide packs, PDF versions that we have provided throughout the entire course. Uh, there's a repository database of all of those documents at the first link, which is gdocs.ttreact.com. So please make use of this to access the material, especially if you have missed any, everything is there. We no longer email out those attachments because it fills people's mailboxes up. So there is this link they'll take you to a box drive and you will get all of the documents and also similarly all of these videos once the videos hold and again i hope that we don't have any internet challenges this evening as we indicated not operating from the usual location uh, we're out of orlando this evening and the internet may be a little bit spotty so we do apologize in advance for uh, any jitter or any issues that are encountered but the videos once recorded are available at the site gvids.ttreact.com now remember when you're typing if you're typing it and make sure to omit the s you know sometimes you will put the s in because it's a secure mode but these are really just uh quick links that will take you to the secure link right so please omit the s here in this case uh so you'll get the redirect if you put the s in it will probably tell you site not found right so just bear that in mind or better yet if you get the slide just click on it and it will open correctly so it's http and not HTTPS. These are just redirection links. Okay. All right. So we do highly recommend that we are using this particular book, the No Nonsense General Class License Study Guide. So we do recommend to participants to consider purchasing this text, as well as there are many other uh, textbooks, such as those by Gordon West. And by the way, he is at Hamcation this year. He'll be presenting tomorrow. So those of you, be sure to check him out. Uh, live he'll be speaking to the community and also the ARL has some excellent books as well please consider purchasing as many of them as you like uh, it's also good to support the authors as well they put a lot of hard work in in preparing these uh, texts and material for us to study so it should be if we can support them let's consider doing so but again it's optional for you you do not have to purchase anything to take this course so uh, none of it is obligatory however we do highly recommend that you consider purchasing at least one and we're using this particular text but feel free to avail yourselves of any of these using the links shown here such as the um, amazon um, site you can get a lot of these texts uh, purchased online also the author's website also will carry the text for purchase you can also purchase um, electronic versions of the product as well as hard copy so everyone learns differently so avail yourself of 
whatever you works best for you. If you need to see things from different authors perspective, you perspectives, you may want to avail yourself of more than one text and read a different um, viewpoint on some of the material as well as to go a little more in depth, more advanced um, information that you may be curious about or it will help you as a ham radio operator. Remember in this course, we are doing light touch theory, but an exam focused, right? So we will not necessarily be going in depth into any one particular topic, but hopefully sufficient for understanding. But to take your knowledge further, we highly recommend availing yourselves of these texts. All right, we had no outstanding questions from the last session. All right, so as we go further to talk about digital modes, just a reminder, this is a reminder slide really, what digital mode is, especially when we're talking about HF, it simply means connecting a computer to a radio. Sometimes we connect it directly via USB cable, sometimes we utilize an interface device or middle device, sometimes called a TNC, terminal node controller. And you'll see some of those terms bandied about in some of these slides. However, we just need to be aware, once we say digital modes, it's using a computer with software, uh, to connect it to the radio. And of course the radio is connected via transmission line or feed line to our antenna. So that's what a digital mode is for the purpose of our conversation. There's also digital voice modes as well, but these are digital modes that we are typically going to be using on the EHF part of the spectrum, right? So just a reminder, when we say digital mode, what we mean. While we're talking about digital modes, just a reminder also what packet radio packetizing is. We are basically taking a chunk of information and we're breaking it up into pieces and then we're sending it through the interface to our radio and through the radio it signals go into the airways and then picked up by another amateur radio operator and the reverse happens it's decoded sent to the interface and then sent to the computer that decodes it on screen and of course what that does in terms of packets it gets reassembled so we chop it up in sending and it's reassembled when it's received so that is what we call a packetized format little chunks uh, we transmit at a time and of course, the software does all of the reassembly with the protocols that we use. All right, so that's just, just a reminder slide. We would have covered those in the technician class and a little bit of already in the general class. But we're moving on to some information here that it is useful for us to remind ourselves what digital modes and packet radio is. So we are talking about digital operating or operating digital modes. And we need to be aware, we had talked about the voluntary band plan. We need to be aware that in a band plan, the band plan will specify the sections of the spectrum, the frequencies that we can and should and ought to use for digital mode operation. It's not the entire band. And therefore we call those subbands. So we need to know for the exam, a couple of those configurations, right? In terms of the range of frequencies that we can input into our radio to operate digital modes. Uh, so again, band plan is our friend. We have just excerpted piece here. We did put this uh, band plan, it's in your uh, GDocs folder. So have a look at it. You will see, uh, you can print it. It's a pretty high resolution 11 by 17 version of this band plan here, but we have exploded a piece. We have um, extracted a little piece and magnified here. And we have also taken um, a detail from the ARL website to show and illustrate for the exam question what we are talking about. These things are not just plucked from a hat. These are actually documented, well documented, and that's, the exams are based on those uh, documented band plans uh, that you'll find in the chart. So we're just showing and referring you to where these questions come from and where they are contained. Of course, they're just picking different aspects of it for the exam. Just like 20 meters, there will be other bands that will have ranges for the frequencies, but for the exam, uh, we just expect it to remember this portion. So we are highlighting it for us uh, so that we can relate the questions and the theory to actual documentation and standards, all right? So again, when we are using digital modes and such digital modes will be such as RITI, uh, Radio Teletype, PSK31, uh, GT65, FT8, and so on, we need to connect a computer to the radio. So we have just excerpted that diagram here just to keep ourselves reminded that digital modes, we use a computer to con uh, connect or interface to the radio instead of speaking, right? Speaking is of course what we call phone mode or voice. 
uh, but we're using not our voice. We're not speaking into the radio or using a microphone. We're using a computer that's interfaced and connected to the radio. And the computer will typically be generating the tones or keying on and off the radio for us, right? And we'll use our keyboard with software that's configured so to do. So we talk about subbands, and these subbands are uh, really a guide to where we can use, uh, what frequencies we can use to uh, employ a particular mode. So if we're doing voice mode or phone mode, there's a particular segment of the band or subband that we will use. If we're doing digital modes, there are specific subbands that we will use. And we need to know for the exam that in the 20 meter band, you can find digital mode operations between 14.070 megahertz and 14.100 megahertz. And we did a zoom in to the band plan and you can see that this uh, bullet point here, the third bullet point down, which is an exam question. Remember, a little tip, most of the time, not all of the time, when you see text in a bullet point in this yellow color, it is usually taken directly from an exam question, right? So it's giving you hints as to what you need to learn, memorize, and uh, commit, because these are the exam questions. These are what you'll get in the real exam. So uh, you can see here from the band plan, 14.070, that's the start here and all the way to 14 decimal 100 all the way down here so between these frequencies 14 decimal 070 and 14 decimal 100 you can typically find most digital modes on the 20 meter band of course for the other bands um, you will find like the 80 meter band the 40 meter band you'll find other ranges of frequencies but for the exam we are just focusing we happen to be talking just about the 20 meter band but just bear in mind that all of the various uh, sub the bands that we have access to as a ham radio operators. Remember, we say that we have quite a lot of spectrum. We access quite a lot of spectrum as ham radio operators. And uh, within that, those areas or pieces of spectrum, we specify what we can transmit, uh, what mode we can use in segments of those bands, and those are called subbands, right? So the segment of the 20 meter band where most digital digital mode operations are commonly found is between 14 decimal 070 and 14 decimal 100 megahertz so you need to learn this and here it is it's extracted from the band plan and you can see this range here is where you have digital modes okay also in relation to another exam question for the 20 meter band we need to know where ft8 is typically found so ft8 is typically found between 14 decimal 074 and 14.077. So for FT8 mode, we need to learn this and practicing hams would already know this uh, because this is where you will tune um, and go and find FT8 uh, transmissions. And probably for the next class, what we can do uh, just as an extra, uh, provide a list of frequencies for FT8 and all of the various bands as well, just for your information. But for the 20 meter band, which is what the exam question is based on, we are honed into just the 20 meter band. This is where you can find FT8, 14 decimal 074 to 14 decimal 077. And you may recognize that this frequency range is a subset of this wider frequency range. This frequency range on this, the third bullet point here is the frequency range for digital modes of any kind or typical digital modes. And FT8 specifically, which is a digital mode, is typically found between 14 decimal 074 074 and 14 decimal 077 again that's a subset or in, it's inside of this range 0, 14 070 is less than 14 074 so this is less than so that means the fd8 starts a little bit into the band but it stops at 14 077 which is before 14 decimal 100 so hopefully that point is taken that this frequency range is in the middle of this uh, general range that you can find digital mode operations and FT8 is a digital mode. All right, so just a reminder what FT8 is, right? So this uh, slide, you can read it on your own, um, but we've just reproduced it here to show you what the FT8 uh, software WSGTX looks like. Talk about what FT8 is, it's a digital mode. We can do short and long range communications and 
Um, for the exam, we'll show you what the questions are, but we need to be aware of time slots and when our radio is transmitting, when the computer is transmitting, it will transmit in 15 second time slots. So we'll come to a slide talking about that a bit more. So within a minute, you will actually have four different time slots, right? 15 seconds, uh, one time slot, what we call uh, odd, then we'll go on even time slot, uh, which is the second one within the minute, and then we'll have the third time slot, which is at 45, and then you'll have the four time slots. So four time slots, odd, even, odd, even within 60 seconds. So 15 seconds multiplied by four should be 60 seconds. So there are four time slots, two of which are odd and two of which are even. And that is important for our next and upcoming slide. But this is just a bit of background information uh, that we have covered before, uh, just uh, to prepare you for what is coming. So this should not be strange if you have covered the material previously that we would have taught. Um, of course, we're just mentioning here that FT8 is great for when you have um, weak propagation or it's very noisy. It's capable of low signal to noise operations. All right, so we're coming to what we need to learn for the exam. So again, we're talking about FT8. So remember, it's a digital mode. We have a computer running probably G WSGTX software and uh, it's interfaced to our computer and the computer is doing the transmission. And because we are talking about time slots, the odd even time slots, 15 seconds, uh, within 60 seconds, there are four transmissions that can occur. And you may have already started to wonder, well, you know, 60 seconds, is it a very specific 15 seconds out of the 60 seconds? And then yes. So therefore time synchronization <clears throat> is very important. So you need to have very accurate time. So your computer has a pretty accurate clock but it shifts or it drifts from time to time. So on your computer itself, you will need to have that computer time synced. Um, and sometimes the um, natural or the default time sync period is not enough. So sometimes you may want to run extra software like Dimension 4 or some other software that maybe every hour or so checks one of the NTP servers on the internet, uh, such as Tick dot time dot com or talk dot time dot com or maybe one of the Microsoft servers and pulls the time down and resynchronizes your clock so you will uh, not not be very far off the timing and there's a requirement for FT8 software to work properly in that your time and the time of other amateur radio operators out on the internet should not be more off by more than one second right so the accuracy <clears throat> you need to be at is your time clock re relative to let's say GPS time or NTP time out on the internet, uh, those time servers um, need to be, uh, you need to be synchronized with those time servers. You cannot be more than a second off because if you're more than a second off, you will have problems with decoding and su such issues. So the point about this slide here is that timing is important. That is true of life generally, but certainly with uh, FT8 mode operation, you need to make sure your clock on the computer is timed and synchronize properly. And that's the exam question, bullet point number two, that an important requirement when you're using FT8 is that the computer time is accurate to within approximately one second. This is an exam question. How do you actually do it? You use one of those uh, uh, software that will go out to the internet and pull the time down and resync your clock, such as Dimension 4. There's a couple of others that are recommended, some of which are free, and there are also paid ones as well. Again, that will allow you to sync up more often than the Windows setting will typically go out and pull down the time sync, right? So important, timing is everything. So when we are transmitting and receiving FT8 modes, so remember it's a digital mode, we're using our computer, we are going to click and send a message and we will receive and decode a message and so on, right? Um, how do we when someone is calling CQ on FT8. So there's an operator, they're operating FT8 mode, they're on the frequency 14.074, for example, and we have heard their CQ. Remember, CQ is that they're calling any station, right? They're looking for contact. They want to communicate with someone. And they're saying, hey, is anyone out there? So they're calling CQ. And when they call CQ, you may wish to respond. But remember, when you're responding, you may want to, in your FT8 software, how far off of 17074, what, what frequency do you actually want to transmit on the offset? So what you do is you look at the waterfall and on your screen here, hopefully it's big enough that everyone can see, on this frequency here, probably 14074, 
you will see that they are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. All of these are transmissions. Each of these vertical representations here, this is called a waterfall. And you can see one amateur radio operator, to operator signal. There's another stronger amateur radio operator signal and so on and so on. And um, the question is, how do you select where you want to communicate with that operator that's calling CQ? So what you do is during the alternate time slot, what you do is you just simply observe your waterfall and you can see where there's a clear space. So notice here there's a transmission, there's a transmission here. But notice here there appears to be nothing. That doesn't mean there's none. It could either be very weak or the propagation doesn't allow you to hear transmission that's on this uh, particular part of the spectrum. Notice you'll see some spaces in between, right? So anytime you see a space, that could mean that it's an unoccupied area of the spectrum and you can select there when you are going to reply to another operator's CQ. So you're hearing CQ, they're calling CQ, that means you know any stations would like to speak with me. And you say, yes, I would like to speak with you. So you would like to reply, but you have to select where you're going to do that reply. And you can select another space as well. And uh, that's the bullet point number three. It talks about good amateur radio practice when we talk in digital modes and FTE operations. It says that good practice when choosing a transmitting frequency to answer a station calling CQ using FT8 is to find a clear frequency during the alternate time slot to the calling station. So remember we talked about within a minute, within 60 seconds, there are actually four transmissions, each of them occupying 15 seconds. And one will be an odd time slot and one will be an even time slot. And then you have an odd time slot and an even time slot. So those four what occurs so that's what they're talking about during the alternate time slot so the time slot that they're transmitting the other time slot will be the alternate time slot so if they are transmitting on odd and e or odd then you look at even and that's part of the configuration of the software and uh, when you get to configuring the software you'll have to choose are you on the odd or are you transmitting on the even that's a choice that you have to make in operating ft8 mode so just saying here is that make sure that you uh, look at the alternate time slot and find a clear frequency. All right, so let's do a few more slides. And by the way, um, so we have a number of things. Uh, this is a pretty busy slide. So we have the FT8 software here, which is called WSGTX is one of them. There are several other, MSHV is another one. Um, and you can use that software to do FT8 mode as well as many other modes, FT4, GT65, and so on. Uh, but part of the software is this waterfall that allows you it almost do a spectral analysis of the frequency range and you can see uh, the various offsets that a ham radio operator is using their signal is here so you'll notice that hams will use different offsets uh, so that they are not on top of each other right um, you can do that inside of the software select what your offset frequency is going to be all right so also we have here uh, this is from qrz.com one of the ham radio operators why we have that up here, this is his name, location, email address, and so on. And this on your bottom right hand side here is actually a conversation that took place uh, where we have uh, this operator, which is Alexander from Poland. Uh, he's calling uh, this operator here. So this is my previous call sign 94 RG. And he's giving his grid square. So he's giving his call sign and he's calling so he's speaking to this or trying to call this person and he is giving his call sign and he is also giving his grid square and what happens in response so this is one time slot and the other time slot this operator 9z4rg responds to sp8 uh onv and gives the signal report so this is actually a qso or a conversation all right maybe 9z4rg was calling cq and sp8 ONV is responding in this uh, transmission here. This is the, uh, the to decode this, this is the time, and this is the frequency offset, and this is the call sign of the uh, called person, and this is the call sign of the calling person. And uh, Alexander gives his grid square, so into location, right? K010, that's the grid square. And uh, the next line is the next time slot where 9Z4RG responds to Alexander and gives the signal report, says, you know, I'm receiving you um, minus you 3 dB. 
And then the next one, now Alexander responds uh, to 9Z4RG and say, hey, I am receiving you at um, minus 18 dB. So uh, the 9Z4RG acknowledges and say, Roger, Roger, 73, which is to close the conversation. All right, so again, this notice when you're in FT8, you're exchanging call signs as well. That is how you can tell who is speaking to whom. And then the last line shows here that um, Alexander is telling 9Z4RG here, 73, which is a greeting, right? So this is an actual FT8 conversation from maybe a couple of weeks, two years ago. And this is what it actually looks like uh, also in this exploded view of the FT8 software WSGTX. So we've just put a bit of information here to make some of it real. Uh, so when you actually become licensed and you're operating, this is what you, the software you'll use. You'll be using a site like QRC.com or look up to find out who's calling you. Sometimes within the software as well, you have things like Grid Tracker that will do all of that automatically for you as well. Software today can do quite a few things. So you don't have to do all of it manually. You can do all of it automatically. So hopefully this has just given and wet your appetite a little bit in terms of operating. We just have a couple of screenshots here to make what this is a little bit real. So we know we're compressed for time and we are just giving little snippets of it. But hopefully this gives an idea of operating additional modes such as FT8 and what a QSO or conversation actually looks like, why timing is important, and also um, how, uh, uh, how you respond to a call for CQ and you see the sequence of operations, the concept of odd and even time slots. And the fact that uh, each of these take 15 seconds, this, one, this time slot also takes 15 seconds, 15 seconds, 15 seconds. So you have a limited time frame within which to uh, transmit all of this information. So that's why uh, you kind of do bare bones uh, transmissions. Within that 15 seconds, you can't say and do a lot. So you just do what you can and exchange of call signs, location, and whether it was received or not, and the closing. So it's not a whole lot of information that you're exchanging during FT8 operations. Very short time frame within which to communicate. So we come to another digital mode, RITI. We have talked about RITI before. Now, there are a couple of ways to do RITI, and one of them is using FSK or frequency shift keying. And for the exam, we need to know that the offset between the mark and space frequencies, as they're called, is 170 hertz. So we have just kind of showed what an uh, RITI signal looks like on the waterfall. But for the exam, we need to know this frequency and this frequency that are used by the RITI signal. The two of them are separated by 170 hertz when we're doing RITI on the HF band. So that's actually an exam question. The most common frequency shift for a RITI or radio tele type emission in the amateur HF band is 170 hertz. So remember, RITI, one of the digital modes, it's a frequency shift keying. Um, also, it can do audio frequency shift keying, which we'll come to in a little bit. But essentially, the radio is transmitting between these two frequencies, right? And that is how the signal is sent and received and encoded on that frequency shifting. The pattern of the frequency shifts uh, what is what will send the various characters, letters, numbers, and so on. Right? That's how the communication works in digital mode. And we just need to know for the exam that these two frequencies are separated. The Mach frequency and the space frequency, the separation is 170 hertz, 170. We'll come to a slide where we'll show where that is configured. Right. So we did say that um, F, uh, RITI, R R T T Y, is typically, or you can do, frequency shift keying, where you shift between two frequencies, the computer will just simply uh, tell the radio shift between the two. But you can also let the computer do modulated signals, where now instead of just frequency shift keying, uh, the computer can send audio to the radio. And when we send audio to the radio, instead of just telling it, telling the radio to shift between two frequencies, there's actually audio and audio signal that leaves the computer that goes to the radio. And when we send that audio to do the uh, RITI mode or whatever digital mode that we are using this audio to, it's called audio frequency shift keying or AFSK. So it's not just the computer telling the radio to shift between the two frequencies to send the signal. The computer is actually going to generate the audio tones and shift between the signals. And we need to be aware 
that for RITI signals, when we are using audio frequency shift keying, we will typically use lower sideband, right? So that's an exam question. And for other types of audio frequency shift keying, such as FT8, GT65, and so on, we use upper sideband. So the takeaways here would be for RITI signals, we use lower sideband. And for others, such as FT8, we use upper sideband. And that's simply convention. But there are exam questions, and we need to learn this for the exam. All right, so this is just an extra slide here uh, that talks about interfacing using uh, the serial port, the different types of serial ports historically that we use. So you can read this on your own time. Today, most modern transceivers have USB ports that we connect to our computer using USB. Of course, sometimes it will still convert into a COM port, but back in the day, what we used to use before USB, and even, even still today, it's actually used quite often still, right? So it's, it hasn't gone away, it's just that we have moved more to USB, but we need to be aware of serial port. This is not an exam, but this is just for your information. Again, we're hoping everyone becomes a licensed amateur radio operator, and you will probably find, especially for the uh, slightly more vintage equipment, that you'll get serial ports on them, and you'll have to, your computer may have a serial port, and if not, you may find yourself having to get a USB to serial converter to connect an older radio that just has a serial port. But the modern radios now tend to have, and they even tend to have Ethernet network ports as well, right? But they tend to have USB ports, and that's how we, uh, sometimes connect our computer to our radio via USB. If not, we may do uh, COM ports like this, the RS-232 ports, to do signaling, and then we may connect via audio cables, uh, inputs and outputs, speaker, microphone cables, and so on. But if you have USB, you can sometimes get all of those signals over USB, right? So this is just historic, but can be very useful to you. All right, so let's see if we just do a couple more slides before we take our break. And folks, we'll just be going a little bit um, later this evening again. So we did talk about RITI configuration when we are using RITI, radio teletype, that mode, that configuration is important. And if we misconfigure our software, then we may not be able to communicate properly. So the parameters or the settings that we have in our software, they're important. All of them are important, but there are a couple that we're going to focus in on. But uh, we need to know that if it is that you have things configured and you are not apparently uh, transmitting properly, you're not be able to decode properly, there could be a few things or a few reasons why that is so. So for instance, if it is that you have tuned your radio properly, you have tuned your frequency correctly, but you are not able to transmit or receive properly, it could be because your software is improperly configured. You may not have properly configured your software, right? Um, so on your screen here, we have the software, we have the uh, actual software. This one here is FL Digi, and we have a configuration screen that shows you where you configure things such as the board rate. We were talking about the mark and space and the fact that the separation between the mark and space would be 170 hertz. You're seeing here for yourself where the setting actually is located. And if you look here, you have 2125. If you were to add 170 to that, you'll get 2295. So therefore, one frequency for mark might be 2125. And when you add 170, the space might be 2295. And those are the two frequencies there for mark and space using RITI. So these settings here are important. And you have the board rate. And what the board rate really is the number of characters that can be transmitted for a particular sig change in signal. Uh, so these are very important parameters, and if we misconfigure them, we may not be able to communicate. People may say, but wait a minute, uh, yes, I'm hearing the transmission, but our software is not decoding or it's uh, decoding gibberish. So this is an exam question, and it says that if you cannot decode and RITI or other FSK signal, even though it is apparently tuned in properly, that means your radio is properly dialed on the correct frequency. If you're not decoding the signal properly, you're getting gibberish instead of you getting call signs and actual communication. One, the mark and space frequencies may be reversed. Two, you may have selected the wrong board rate, so you may have an incorrect board rate here. Uh, the mark and space frequencies may be reversed. Instead of you have mark uh, one and space the other, you may have uh, swap them uh, confront so you need to be aware of that and also 
you may have selected the wrong sideband if you're doing audio frequency shift keying. Instead of using lower sideband, you might have the setting on your radio to upper sideband. So these are some of the settings that are important that you must configure your radio to utilize when you are doing these modes. It is very important that you make the correct setting on your equipment. So folks, at this time, we will take a two minute break and we will see you back. Get up, take a stretch, maybe have a bathroom break, some water. I'll be back in two minutes time to continue. All right, so welcome back everyone. So it's important that when we're using software to do any kind of amateur radio operation, whether it's digital mode or any other activity that we pay attention to the settings on the software, because incorrect settings, misconfiguration can lead to a lot of stress. And heartache so it's important that we pay attention and know what are the critical settings all right so we come to another digital mode and that is using what is called winlink now winlink is used to communicate among amateur radio operators by sending email that can also include things like attachments and reports and any other information uh, using a computer now on the right hand side here we have extra information this is not an exam but hopefully it will help us to understand what winlink is so winlink requires us to have some kind of uh, client software um, and that client software will communicate to what we call radio message servers or gateways and those gateways will communicate to uh, servers that are called common message servers so that's the winlink hierarchy and we can communicate our computer could communicate either via connected radio or it could also communicate via the internet so via radio you have different protocols that can be used you can use protocols such as pact or adop you can use vara and there are a couple of other protocols uh, that uh, robust packet 
that exists out there, but some are more popular than others. And it requires the compatibility between the client system and the RMS gateway. So if you're using a radio RMS gateway that is capable of doing Pacto and Vara, those are the two protocols that you need to speak. However, uh, apart from radio or RF communications to do WinLink, you can also do internet-based communication. So the software, once you're con internet connected, you can run a protocol called Telnet, and Telnet 2 uh, will allow you to communicate as well. So it runs the RMS software on your RMS Express software on your client computer, and your client computer may be connected to a radio, and your radio can go RF to a station that is set up as a gateway or as a server. And that is called an RMS gateway. And that's an exam question we come up to in a little bit. And those RMS gateways will communicate to the common method servers and store the information. And then when another client is ready to retrieve their email, kind of like long ago, if you may, those who are, may recall bulletin board systems, BBSs, right, where you have a store and forward type mechanism, it's uh, very similar as well. Of course, this is just a simplified view. It's not the entire story, but for the exam, it, this is a, could be a very helpful diagram. So you see the clients running RMS Express software. You will have um, internet based or radio based um, servers that are also internet connected that allows the routing of the messages to these CMS or what we call common message servers and store and forward the message so that another client can receive via radio uh, the message or via a protocol such as Telnet. So you can read this bit on your own time about WinLink. All right. So for the exam, we need to know what WinLink is and the description of WinLink. And there are a couple of bullet points here that we have that talks about what WinLink is. Before we, before we go into the bullet points itself, though, uh, this on your right hand side is an exploded view of the WinLink Express software, right, or sometimes called RMS Express. So this software here in the background, um, when we are ready to communicate uh, with, let's say, uh, HF RMS or HF Relay Station, so that we can send our email using radio, uh, there's a directory of RMS stations. So you can see here, you have the call sign of the station, the frequency that is operating on, and you can also see which mode. And in this case here, you'll see pack to four, pack to three, pack to four, pack to three, pack to two. It tells you the capability of the station. This is a directory, and it shows the location via grid square where the relay station is or the RMS station. And it shows you the hours of operation and who can use it tells you how far it is away, you know, what direction it is from you. And most importantly, it tells you what's the likelihood of your success to be able to communicate via radio frequency to that relay station. So remember, you're sitting in front of your computer. You're running RMS Express or Willing Express. And that software, you're going to compose an email message and you're going to click send. And that client software will key up your radio and it will send the various, the signal to the particular server on the internet. Um, but that server is connected to a radio. So the radio will actually receive your transmission and then connect it to the internet for you. So that's how WinLink operates. And that's why you need to understand what's the best propagation path to the server or the RMS gateway that will receive your signal. And this shows you here, green is you know strong. You have um, yellow and then red is a bit weaker, right? So this is what you use when you're looking to select the particular gateway that you want to send your message through to get through to another amateur radio operator. So you yourself may just have access to RF and HF. You don't have internet, but you can relay through these RMS gateways an email message and you can even send attachments. You can use standard forms such as let's say ICS forms or the ARL radiogram or the React radiogram or whatever message format or template that you wish to use. You can attach it to all of that just like you would use Outlook uh, as a client software for instance or any email software that you may use to compose and read 
receive email messages, you will use as an amateur radio operator, RMS Express or WinLink Express to create, compose your email and then have that software send via the radio that message to its destination. And also you will be able to read or pull back or receive messages that are waiting stored there for you when you make a connection to the RMS or what is called the Remote Message Server Gateway. All right, so let's deal with the bullet points for the exam. So first of all, WinLink is an amateur radio wireless network that's used to send and receive email on the internet. So that's the first bullet point, what WinLink is, an exam question. Also, it's a form of packet radio. So remember early on uh, in the session, we talked about what digital modes is and packet radio is. And we said packet radio is when you take a message and you uh, chop it up a little bit and send it over RF. And then when it gets to the other side, it's reassembled. So this is why we covered or remind ourselves what packet radio is because WinLink is a form of packet radio. And also WinLink is a wireless network capable of both VHF and HF band operation. So we have been talking about using HF band. So these frequencies here is on the HF band, but you can also do VHF. So you have VARA HF, uh, VARA VH, uh, VHF as well, of what we call it VARA FM. And you can use the various um, bands on amateur radio to send and receive email messages. Again, this is what WinLink is about. So hopefully the descriptions and maybe these uh, screenshots here is giving a better idea as to what WinLink is. It's basically email for amateur radio. So another name for WinLink Remote Message Server <coughs> or Remote Message <coughs> Server RMS. Uh, it's abbreviated often as RMS. You'll hear about talking about RMS it's called the gateway. So when our client software contacts the other side, uh, the radio that's receiving, that's receiving our transmission and going to send it off to the internet, to the CMSs, that is called a gateway. So we are communicating with gateways. So you'll notice that all of these here, these call signs are gateways and the frequency of operation, the modes, and all the other parameters that's important to know about the gateway. So you simply select one of the gateways. And then when you do that, you click send and your radio uh, will do the transmission. The software will send the signal to the radio and the radio will transmit on the frequency to the gateway and the gateway will receive it. And also the gateway, if it has messages for you, will transmit on its radio and your radio will receive it and send it to the software, the WinLink Express or the RMS Express software and display on your screen in your inbox the messages that are destined for you. Okay, so a question that comes up in the exam is how do you establish communication with an RMS or remote message server or gateway? How do you know what frequency it operates on? Well, simply there's a directory, just like a phone book, and it's in the software itself. So that is what you do. These are the call signs, these are the frequencies, and it's a published list. So that is the exam question. One way to establish contact with a digital message messaging system gateway station is to transmit a connect message on the station's published frequency. And this is what we have here, the stations, the call signs and the frequencies that they have published. This is a directory. Okay, we just have a note here that for WinLink, we can use uh, very strong protocols uh, such as Pactor. There's another one called Vara. And of course, we can also, if we're not using radio, and we want to use the internet to send our email across, maybe we have internet access, we can do so via the Telnet protocol. This is just some extra information for you that WinLink Express or RMS Express software can use radio frequency as well as the internet to send and receive our email. So we don't have to use RF, but that's the beauty about amateur radio. Imagine if internet generally is down in our area, we can use RF to get to stations that do have internet access and send email. So. You know that last mile, our localized internet may be down, but we can still as ham radio operators send messages. And this could be very important during emergencies and disasters or just for using um, regular uh, events that we're supporting. All right, so folks, I did mention that we are going to be going a bit extra over time. And folks, again, my internet access here is a little bit choppy, I know. So hopefully things are working reasonably well enough and not too many issues. So let's press on. 
So we did mention that we can use several protocols when we're using Winglink. We said we can use Pacto, we said we could use Vara is another one, right? So we say, this is an exam question, Vara is a digital protocol used with Winlink. And we're just giving you some extra information. This is when you download Vara and you can also get the registration key for it. This is what it looks like on your screen when you're transmitting and receiving messages via this protocol known as Vara. Now Vara, acts as a TNC, right? It acts to convert the signals or the messages or the email or the files that you want to send uh, to sounds that the radio can transmit and receive. So this is almost like a virtual modem, if you want to call it that. So this is what it looks like, and it's called VARA. On this particular one is VARA FM. There's also VARA HF. All right. So sometimes when we are doing our winlink operation so again this is a screenshot in your right hand side here that shows you the winlink software it's winlink express you see you have an inbox and an outbox and sent mail and so on just like any email system or email client uh, would have so this is a message and we are sending and receiving messages so again hopefully you get the idea that this software allows us to send and receive email as amateur radio operators but there can be problems. Sometimes you will not get the message uh, properly. You will be trying to send and it fails. And exam questions, we need to know what could be happening or what are some of the could cause interference. So the symptoms that may result from other signals interfering with a Pacto or Vara transmission. So because it's Pacto and Vara here, we are talking about Winlink in this instance. Uh, one, frequent retries or time, timeout. So you'll see your radio transmitting, the software is trying to send a message and it's retrying and it's retrying and then it's telling you timeout, right? So that's one of the symptoms. Another symptom is that there's a long pause in message transmission. Also, failure to establish a connection between stations. So these are exam bullet point questions that you need to learn. These are the symptoms or some of the symptoms that tells you that there may be some other signal that is impacting or impinging on your attempts to communicate via radio frequency from your station to the RMS save or what we call the gateway station. These are symptoms. Now a question, something, you know, as we operate on the internet, you know, we have very collaborative protocols. We can do a meeting, we can do Google Meets, we can do WhatsApp and have a conversation between multiple persons. We can join a multi-conference bridge and communicate. So a natural question that um, ham radio operators will ask is, well, can three or four of us communicate using wing, wind link simultaneously? Um, can we, <coughs> excuse me, use the PACTA protocol to communicate between two and three and four people simultaneously? So this is actually an exam question, and it speaks to the fact that using PACTA, PACTA protocol only allows two parties to be able to communicate at any one time. So if you uh, speak, you, are, you have a transmission going between yourself and another amateur radio operator, no other amateur radio operator is able to come in and communicate with either of you at that same time. So we need to be aware of that as a requirement um, or a limitation, if you want to call it that, or a constraint really might be a better word of the Pacto protocol. And that's an exam question, last bullet point. To join an existing contact in progress between two stations using the Pacto protocol is not possible as Pacto connections are limited to two stations. Okay, so we did deal with mesh networks before. I think we talked about broadband ham net or HSMM. And we also talked about Arden, which is another form of a mesh network. So on your screen, uh, you can read this on your own time, what the Arden um, network is. Uh, it's a mesh network, and we can use to communicate um, very high speed communications uh, that can be established, especially for events and emergencies as well. And it repurposes the standard routers, such as ubiquity routers, using amateur radio license privileges such as higher frequency uh, higher power output as well as an expanded slightly um, different frequencies to what commercial and members of the public can use so it's really repurposing 
And because it's using those routers, therefore, you know, it becomes very affordable. The mesh networks establish communication between various nodes, and therefore you can have various routes for a message to take. And if one node fails, once there's a mesh network, you have sufficient nodes around, the message will be automatically rerouted using one of the protocols and gets this gets this destination. So that's why mesh networking is very helpful in amateur radio. So we have on your screen a map of the Arden network that's uh, fairly current. And we also have a little topology map here to show you what mesh networking is. So you have many to many com uh, connections. So this node here, this amateur radio operator is connected to this amateur radio operator is connected to this one and so on. Uh, so they will have wireless routers at the various locations, but their wireless routers can see several others as well. And once you have this, this is called a mesh network or mesh topology. So for the exam, we need to know that the primary purpose of an amateur radio emergency data network, also known as ARDEN, the mesh network is to provide high-speed data services during an emergency or to service community events. Right? And this is a screenshot here to show an example of two nodes in ARDEN. Right? This is what it actually looks like using the Ubiquiti routers. All right, folks. So again, we go in a little extra and over time, a few more slides to go. And then of course, our uh, question pool review. So again, I'm hoping that the internet is holding sufficiently and not too much of an issue. Again, I do apologize, not at the usual location, as we mentioned at the start of the class, we are presently out of Orlando, Florida, where there's hamcation that's taking place. So uh, we do apologize for any internet issues. Okay, so, that brought an end the operation part of the syllabus and we are now coming into safety right so let's talk a bit about rf safety we did say that as ham radio operators safety first we deal with electronics we deal with electricity and we also deal with uh, emissions from antennas that emit electromagnetic waves or radio frequencies and that can be harmful especially at higher power levels. So we need to be aware of how do we prevent ourselves and other persons in our vicinity from becoming harmed. Um, and yes, you can become harmed from amateur radio operations. So that's why we are trained to protect ourselves and to protect anyone else that may come in contact with our equipment or antennas and radios and transmission lines and towers and so on. So safety first, very important. So we're now talking about RF safety and exposure to radio frequency. And while it cannot be seen, while it is colorless, odorless, you can't see it, you can't taste it, you can't touch it, but it can harm us in ways that, you know, you can get an RF burn, for example. And how that happens is that radio frequency can heat up body tissue and therefore cause burns. So that's actually an exam question in that one way that RF energy can affect human body tissue is that it heats body tissue. Of course, different, different frequencies, or different ranges of frequencies will have different effects on the human body and tissues. So we need to know how to calculate, what to calculate and what to watch out for to ensure that we keep those exposure limits lower uh, let's say we don't want to harm ourselves or if we have other persons around our house or our shack or if we're operating out in the public we need to know how to calculate what do we need to do to make sure that we do not expose those persons to radiation radio frequency emissions above the maximum possible permissible exposure limits or what is called the mpe so time averaging is one of the techniques that we use when we evaluate our radio frequency radiation exposure and what you do is that you take the total radio frequency exposure, but average over a period. So that is called time averaging. And that's a definition that we need to learn for the exam. So that time averaging, when evaluating RF for radio frequency radiation exposure, it means the total RF exposure averaged over a certain period. And that is a definition that you need to learn for the exam because you will get it as a question. So 
um, we also need to be aware of the concept of duty cycle. And we talked about duty cycle before in this course, and we just reproduced a little diagram here to show you that, you know, for 50% duty cycle, that means you're, you're transmitting half of the time and you're not transmitting half of the time. That's 50% duty cycle. 75% duty cycle means that you are transmitting 75% of the time and 25% you are not. And 25% duty cycle means that you are transmitting only 25% of the time, but 75% of the time or three quarter, you are off. And of course, these are not the only duty cycles, 50, 75, 25. You can have any um, value of a duty cycle, but we have just illustrated three uh, graphically here to show you that when you have a higher duty cycle, you actually have more exposure. And that's an exam question that says that um, if you lower the duty cycle, you can transmit at higher power levels, right? So let's deal with that bullet point. The effect of modulation duty cycle on RF exposure or just duty cycle is that a lower duty cycle permits greater power levels to be transmitted. So let's break that down a little bit. If I am transmitting at 75% duty cycle, I may have to reduce my power levels because remember we talked about time averaging, the amount of RF that a person is exposed to. If my duty cycle is so high, the mode of transmission is so very much high then i may have to back off my power just to maintain the maximum exposure limit or not to exceed it but if my duty cycle is low i'm only transmitting part of the time and most of the time i'm off then i could run a higher power output because remember with respect to our exposure we're talking about time averaging so if it is that we are transmitting less that means i could transmit at a higher power before I exceed my maximum permissible exposure limit. And that's what this bullet point is saying here, that the effect of modulation duty cycle on RF exposure, so that's the modulating duty cycle, is that a lower duty cycle permits greater power levels to be transmitted. So if I'm using a lower duty cycle, I could run higher power as a ham radio operator. Very scientific. So also, um, when we are talking about uh, determining the maximum permissible exposure limits from RF, there are some uh, parameters about our signal that we need to be mindful of, we need to look at, we need to be aware of uh, when we are doing our calculation as well. And these parameters are given and also part of an exam question will ask you what are the properties that are used to determine RF exposure from a transmitter? The first one is its duty cycle. So we spoke about that. We need to know the duty cycle. Is it a very high or heavy duty cycle like this? Or is it a very low duty cycle? Also the frequency, because different frequencies have different uh, effects on the human body. And we do have an extra slide. We did cover it before um, in the class. But we have reproduced it here to show you that different frequencies are absorbed differently by the human body. So the frequency matters and also the power density. What does that mean? If I'm using an omnidirectional antenna that sends the signal out 360 degrees all around, then the power density may be lower. But if I'm using an antenna and I'm concentrating the signal in one direction, such as a Yagi antenna or a beam antenna or a quad antenna, any of those that sends most of the signal in one direction transmitting, then the power density here will be higher and therefore the exposure limit would also be high as well. So these are some of the parameters that we need to be aware of in determining RF exposure. So this exam question, the following properties are used to determine RF exposure from a transmitted signal. The duty cycle, the frequency, and the power density. So we've just shown uh, visually here these various concepts. The duty cycle, the frequency, and the power density. Okay, also, if it is that we install an antenna, whether outdoor or indoor, we need to make sure that a member of the public or family members or someone else or even another amateur radio operator does not come into contact or come close enough to the antenna that will cause them to exceed the maximum per permissible exposure limit. So this is an exam question. So, and it talks about indoor transmission. So you can have an antenna indoors. Yes, it's possible. Uh, if someone comes up close to it, they can be exposed through that radio frequency uh, emission in excess of what is permissible by regulations. So bullet point, a precaution that should be taken if you install an indoor transmitting antenna is to make sure that the MPE and MPE is maximum permissible exposure limits are not exceeded in the occupied area. So if you're installing an antenna anywhere actually, but this exam question speaks about it being indoors, just make sure 
that it will not exceed the MPE for the particular area so that someone cannot come close enough to the antenna and be exposed in excess of what they, uh, they should. Okay, so like we just talked about regulations exist. There are guidelines for doing these evaluations. How do you determine whether or not your station is in compliance with the RF exposure limits? So there are a few ways that you can do so. And remember, we talked about time averaging. We defined what time averaging is because it's important uh, in respect of this bullet point here. The stations that are subject to the FCC rules on RF exposure, meaning amateur radio operators, are all stations with a time average transmission of no more than one milliwatt, right? So this is an exam question. And also, if it is that you need to take steps to comply with the regulations, what steps must you take? How do you comply with the regulations? Do you just imagine that you would? Do you just hope that nothing happens? Do you just uh, hope or anticipate that the signal will not, uh, the exposure limits will not be exceeded? No. What we do is we perform evaluations and calculations especially for if it is someone may come into close contact with our antenna or our radio systems and that's the uh, subject of the next bullet point which is an exam question the following steps must be taken by an amateur operator to ensure compliance with rf safety regulation perform a routine rf exposure evaluation and prevent access to any identified high exposure areas so what that means is we are going to evaluate our RF exposure uh, limits. We are uh, on an upcoming slide. We'll see how we do it. And if we have higher than what is expected or acceptable, we need to make sure that we put barriers so that persons will not be able to go into those areas. That's why, for example, on some sites you will see that there it's restricted. It'll say radio frequency present. And you cannot go in there unless the power levels are turned down or the transmitters are turned off because the exposure limits there are too high after you've done the evaluation. So we said that there are techniques, we said there are ways to go about doing the evaluation. But how do we do the evaluation? Well, again, it's based on scientific principles and there are steps or procedures to conduct those radio frequency exposure evaluations so the first one is a document hopefully you can see it on your screen it is called the fcc federal communication commission's oet bulletin 65. so this is a screenshot of that bulletin that's one way that you can find a procedure to conduct your rf exposure evaluation for your station Another way is that you can use software. You can either download software to use, or you can go and use a website that will allow you to conduct that evaluation via computer modeling. So for example, here, this is a, a calculation that's done on a website, and the website is actually on, this, on the uh, slide here, so you can take a look at it. And this allows you to do calculation using computer modeling. Also, you can get and invest in an instrument called a field strength meter, such as this one here. So on your field strength meter, this little bulb here is the antenna, and you have the instrument that will do the measurement and display what the exposure is. So there are three ways that you can conduct uh, RF exposure evaluation. Using this bulletin, OET Bulletin 65, you can use a computer modeling such as a website or software that you download, or you can use an instrument called a field strength meter. And that is actually the, uh, an exam question. You can determine that your station complies with the FCC RF exposure regulations by one calculation based on the FCC OET, OET Bulletin 65, that's this document. Calculation based on computer modeling, that means using software that you download or a website and also by measurement using a field strength meter that's calibrated. So that's this instrument here. And the bullet point here uh, just expands on the last uh, previous bullet point, which is the type of instrument that can be used to accurately measure an RF field strength is a calibrated field strength meter with a calibrated antenna. So notice they use the word calibrated here quite often. And that's just saying it's not just good enough to use an instrument, but the instrument 
must have been cal uh, calibrated according to a reference standard because instruments can go out of sync it can go out of calibration in time so some instruments rec they require recalibration periodically and also certification so they are emphasizing here that you must use calibrated instruments okay so um a question that comes up is if your station fails to meet the R FCC RF exposure exemption criteria. Now, what is the FCC exposure exemption criteria? That exemption criteria, according to this document, the, the, OEC, the OET Bulletin 65, is when you have a QRP station or what we call a very low power operating station. If you're operating very low power, then that is an exemption uh, or what, what we call the exemption criteria but if you're doing something other than running very low power you must and shall perform an rf exposure evaluation of your station and you must use this bulletin or you can use any of the other me methods that we talked about that you can use to perform the exposure evaluation right so all of them are here highlighted in this document and what we'll seek to do is probably to upload this document into the file share for all participants to have access to. All right, so let's read out this bullet point. It's an exam question. If your station fails to meet the FCC RF exposure exemption criteria, and remember that exemption criteria is if you're using low power. So everyone else that's not using low power must perform an RF exposure evaluation but in accordance with FCC OET Bulletin 65, this document here. Now, what happens if when you do an evaluation, you find that you have exceeded the MPE, the maximum permissible exposure limit for a human, right? Remember we said that human tissues can be heated um, and other negative side potential side effects of radio frequency emissions. Well, what you do is you put a barrier, you take all steps necessary to prevent someone from uh, getting access. It could be a physical barrier, it could be signs, it could be um, all sorts of uh, physical measures, notifications to let people know. You could put uh, tape, you could put um, lock uh, barriers and doorways, and you can use any means necessary that is legal to prevent someone from accessing those areas. But it's important that you prevent them. You don't want somebody to go into the area and be exposed and have some sort of a incident or they get damaged. You have a safety incident. But we say safety first, right? That's Notice that's on top of all of these slides here. So that's the next bullet point. If an evaluation of your station shows that the RF energy radiated by your station exceeds permissible limits for possible human absorption, you must take action to prevent human exposure to the excessive RF field. So you may have an antenna out there and you do an evaluation and you find that the permissible limits have been exceeded. So what you do is make sure that no one can get there when the transmitters are active. And one of the ways are signs and barriers to make sure that's your responsibility. Okay, so let's deal with this last uh, bullet point here. Uh, if an evaluation shows that a neighbor might experience more than the allowable limit of RF exposure from the main lobe of a directional antenna. So what that means is that you're using a, some like a Yagi, a directional antenna. And because that antenna concentrates or directs a lot of the signal in a particular uh, direction, you may have your antenna pointed towards your neighbor or could it could potentially point towards your neighbor. And when you do your calculation, you realize your neighbor might be in a vicinity that allows them to be exposed unnecessarily to high rate, um, levels of radio frequency emissions. So if that is happening to you, what you need to do is make sure that they cannot be exposed to those transmissions. So you take all precautions necessary. So for example, if your neighbor, I mean, they're not at home at a particular time, for example, then they will not be exposed. So maybe you can coordinate with them and say, you know, what times are you not there? I can use this Yagi antenna so that when you're not at home, you will not be personally um, exposed or anyone in your home, your house household will not be exposed to, the, to those um, radio frequency transmissions. So that is one way, for example, or uh, just make sure that you point the antenna in uh, the opposite direction or another direction that doesn't cause 
uh, this main lobe uh, to be pointed in their direction. So you could point it away from. Maybe you have a huge field on the opposite side or something like that where there's no one typically or you can point it away from them. So that's the bullet point. If the evaluation shows that a neighbor might experience more than the allowable limit for RF exposure from the main lobe of a directional antenna, you should take precautions to ensure that the antenna cannot be pointed in their direction when they are present. This is an extra slide. We did talk about the human body uh, responding differently to various frequencies. So this um, axis here, the X axis shows uh, the various frequencies and the absorption as well. So we have a maximum permissible exposure limit and notice that that limit is um, at the trough or at around 50 megahertz or so because that's where the human body really, really um, absorbs um, that energy in a negative way so that you want to limit uh, these frequencies. But of course, if you use lower frequencies or even higher frequencies, you'll notice that the maximum permissible exposure limit goes up. And that's just because the human body and tissues uh, do not respond in the same way to these frequencies as uh, the frequencies that you see here in this plateau on the graph, right? So this is a bit of an extra slide. We covered it before, but we're just trying to tie things together and reference some of these concepts that we've been talking about theoretically so that you can see when we're saying that the human body responds differently to different frequencies or frequency is an important parameter or factor in calculating maximum permissible exposure limits. You can see there's a, a graph that scientifically shows that. Again, an extra slide that we would have covered before. These are things that you um, may want to take into account when uh, dealing with a human being and being exposed to radio frequency from an antenna. So again, extra slide, you can read this up. Again, we would have covered this before. Also another extra slide, again, in relation to radio frequency, what can you do to uh, make sure that we don't expose human beings to unnecessary radio frequency emissions, right? So you can make sure you comply, you can you know, vary the distance, uh, change your transmit output power and so on. Right, so um, right. let's talk a bit about the importance of safety. And we are coming to the end of the slides and we'll go straight into the question pool review shortly. So invariably as amateur radio operators, height is might. And therefore we tend to use tower structures like on your right hand side here, this is a tower. And someone has to climb that tower to put up the antenna or someone has to go up or access uh, the reason that you're using a tower is that we said height is might and you want to put your antenna up and the person that is going to be climbing this tower it may be you uh, make sure that you're appropriately trained and you're using the requisite personal protective equipment the ppe so for the exam we need to know that if we are using a harness like this to climb a tower there are a couple of things that we need to bear in mind about the harness. First of all, it must be able to support the weight. If you have a harness that does not support the weight of the climber, you can have an accident. Also, these harnesses can have an expiry date. They can be valid for a particular time after which you need to discard them because the material has deteriorated. So you need to be aware of those two parameters when it comes to safety harnesses that you may use to climb a tower. The weight limitation and the expiry date. So that's the first bullet point. It says when climbing a tower using a safety harness, an important safe work practice that should be observed is to confirm that the harness is rated for the weight of the climber and that it is within the allowable service life. So weight of the climber, it could support the weight and also the expiry date. It's within the allowable service life. Don't use it after, that's dangerous. But again, a tower here, when you're climbing it, um, may also support things like rotors. You may have a rotor or some other device that is powered on your tower. And if you're going to climb that tower, you need to make sure that you de-energize any such device. So if you have, especially, uh, depending on the voltage that it's operating at as well. So one um, requirement is before you climb the tower, you need to de-energize 
any electrical circuits that are going to or up the tower. Again, you may have a rotor or rotator, as it's sometimes called at the top. You may have uh, some other um, active device that's powered. And it's important that before the person climbs that you de-energize or you open the breaker or you switch off the supply or you disconnect the power. And also, it is important, if it's a breaker that you're switching off, for example, to de-energize, you also need to lock it out and you need to tag it out. You need to put a sign that says, do not operate. You also, in some places, you can do a lockout as well, where you put a, a, a lock with a key that someone cannot uh, re-energize without getting the lock removed, right? So that's called lockout, tagout, right? May not be available to everyone to easily do. However, it's important that we are aware of the concepts. And then, of course, if you're in an industrial setting, it's a must. In a home setting, you have to find ways uh, maybe you might want to put somebody to stand up by the breaker panel while someone is servicing. So that anyone comes to do anything, they say, hold on, don't go there because someone is working on the tower. So again, do everything that you can to protect the tower climber. Before climbing a tower that supports electrically powered devices, make sure all circuits that support that supply power to the tower are locked out and tagged. All right, so I think this is our final slide. And this has to do with tower grounding safety. Well, our tower needs to be grounded for several reasons. We did talk about grounding and bonding previously. And because our tower is essentially like a lightning rod, once we put it up, you can have lightning that will be attracted by the tower. And therefore, you need to ground it. So on the right-hand side here, you have the base platform and you have the tower leg here. And of course, um, we notice that we have grounded the tower to a ground rod. So one of the things we need to be aware of is we need to use a, a physical device uh, such as a clamp. Uh, you can also do, um, you know, there's a form of welding that can be used. But what you should not do is use solder. Solder should not be used at all when you're talking about uh, ground equipment such as ground rods and ground wires and so on. Uh, you can do CAD welding, right? that is very acceptable, but you do not want to do soldering. right? And the reason is simply when that lightning strikes, that solder will literally evaporate, right? It's a eutectic, so that solder will go poof. And all of a sudden now, if that was holding your ground rod uh, via the uh, grounding cable to the clamp, it will literally disconnect, right? And you're no longer protected in a flash, <laughs> no pun intended. So solder is not to be used. And that's the first bullet point. Solder joints should not be used in lightning protection, ground connections, because a solder joint will likely be destroyed by the heat of a lightning strike. It's there to protect you, but it will not if you are using solder. Again, physical, screw, bolts, nuts, what have you, and even CAD welding, in the case of the ground rod here, could be done, but not soldering. And also, we need to be aware that if you have ground rods, more than one, uh, each leg, let's say, goes to a separate ground rod, you have to bond them. So remember, we talked about grounding, grounding and bonding when we were talking about our amateur radio shack, that yes, we need to ground, but we also need to bond everything together. It's not sufficient to just ground one leg of the tower and then ground another leg of the tower we need to bond them together. The reason is that you can have ground loops and you want to bring everything to the same potential. Uh, so what you do, apart from grounding, you then run another wire to every other uh, ground as well so that none of them are isolated from one another. They need to be common and that's called bonding. Just a reminder, we haven't come to the questions yet, but G1 C08 and G1C10 from the question pool. If you have that version of question pool, have been withdrawn. Also the text. And on the text, it's pages 135 and 136. All right. So let's go quickly uh, to our question pool review uh, for all of the questions related to the theory we would have covered this evening. So let us see. Um, we have gone a bit extra this evening, folks. So let's see how we can speed through these questions. Okay, in what segment of the 20 meter band are most digital mode operations commonly found? 
So we did say that for additional modes in the 20 meter band, it's between 14.070 and 14.100 megahertz. Next question. Which of the following is a common location for FD8? So again, the example we used was in the 20 meter band. And in the 20 meter band, it's between 14.074 and 14.077. Again, that is a subset of the band that you use digital modes in. All right, so just bear in mind, again, you have the equivalent for the 40 meter band, the 80 meter band, and, and so on, right? All of the HF spectrum will have its ranges of frequencies that you can use for digital modes and for also FD8. Which of the following is required when using FD8? It's important that the computer time is accurate to within approximately one second. Next question in the question pool. Which of the following is good practice when choosing a transmitting frequency to answer a station calling CQ using FD8? Let's dissect this question. What are they asking us? Good practice. In other words, what should we do when we are doing what? We are using FT8 and we are responding to someone calling CQ. Remember, CQ is saying that operator wants to communicate with another ham. Doesn't know the call sign, but saying, I'm available to talk. I'm available to exchange information. I'm available to have a conversation. That's what they're saying when they're calling CQ. But what's good practice when you're going to reply? You find a clear frequency during the alternate time slot to the calling stations. Remember, we said that within a 60 second, there are going to be four time slots, uh, an odd, an even, an odd, and then an even. Right, so during the alternate time slot, so if they are transmitting on the odd time slot, the alternate time slot will be the even time slot. And that's where you find a clear frequency um, to place your transmission in on the software. Right, so we talk, we talk about using the waterfall that you can see visually where there might be a clear part of the spectrum. Right, so remember the time slots, it's uh, again odd even, odd even, and there are four of those slots in a 60 second time frame. Why four? Because an FTA transmission lasts for 15 seconds each, each time slot. Next question in the question pool. What is the most common frequency shift for RITI emissions in the amateur HF bands? So we did see between the mark and space, it's 170 hertz, 170. So look at the other distractors, 85, 425, 850. We didn't talk about those, right? It's 170, 170 zero which mode is normally used when sending RITI signals via AFSK with an SSB transmitter okay let's dissect this question a little bit what are they asking us which mode is normally used lower sideband upper sideband those that's what they're asking us right when sending RITI signals but via AFSK so you can send RITI signals via just frequency shift keying Tell the radio one frequency, the other, the other, the other, the other. But you can also have the radio generate the audio tones to send to the radio. And when you do that, you have to select a sideband mode. And we said for RITI, that sideband is lower sideband or LSB. Similar question, same thing, but for other modes such as FT8, what is the standard sideband for GT65, GT9, FT8, and F FT4? Uh, digital signals when using AFSK. So remember, AFSK again is audio frequency shift keying. Remember when we talk about RITI, we can do frequency shift keying or we can do audio frequency shift keying. Well, with modes such as FT8, it is audio frequency shift keying. And for these modes, it's conventional to use upper sideband. So again, for RITI, it's lower sideband, but for FT8 and so on, it's upper sideband. All right. What could be wrong if you cannot decode a RITI or other FSK signal, even though it is apparently tuned in properly. Let's dissect this question. They say, what can be wrong? In other words, what are the issues? If you have an RITI uh, transmission or some other FSK signal and you cannot decode it. So you're receiving a transmission, but you're not decoding it. You're getting gibberish on your screen, all sorts of random characters. But when you look on your radio, you will see that your radio is properly tuned into the correct frequency. So it tells us that it's not only having correct frequency readout on our radio that's important. We have to make sure that we have the correct configuration in the software that we use, such as FLDG. So 
all of these bullet points or all of these options are in fact correct. So the answer will be D, all these are correct. Or I shouldn't say D, it will be all these are correct. Remember, folks, in the actual exam, A, B, C, and D may not match up here with the question pool as we have it, right? D, all of these choices may be choice A. It could be choice B, it could be choice C. So they will mix up this. So don't try to learn or the answer to this will be D, at least necessarily. So sometimes it's like that. You will have all of these choices as the last one. That's fine. But just bear in mind, otherwise, when you have a question, it's not guaranteed what A and B and C is in for the practical question. You may find in the question pool that the actual exam that you get, you'll find that they may put this as option B and this as option C. They may mix it up for you, right? So try not to learn um, it's the first answer, the second or the third or the fourth for a particular question, right? That's ill-advised. So one, you tune your radio properly, but you're not decoding the RITI signal or the FSK signal. What else could be wrong apart from correctly choosing the frequency and the dial? The mark and space frequencies may be reversed. Remember, there are two frequencies for frequency shift keying, separated in the case of RITI by 170 hertz. Well, they may be reversed. You may also have selected the wrong baud rate. Remember what we said the baud rate is? Uh, the number of symbols, uh, the number of uh, characters that can be exchanged with one signal uh, transition. So that may be wrong. You have to correct it and make sure it's correct for the particular mode. Uh, you may also be listening on the wrong sideband. Instead of selecting your frequency readout might be correct, but instead of lower sideband, you might have selected upper sideband. So remember for RITI, it needs to be lower sideband, not upper sideband. So you may have sit incorrectly on the radio selected the wrong sideband. So all of those things you need to look out for. Right. Which of the following describes win link? What is WinLink? Well, all of these are actually correct. It's an amateur radio wireless network to send and receive email on the internet. It is also a form of packet radio, and it's a wireless capable wireless network that's capable of both VHF and UHF band operation. So you can do WinLink on HF, and you can also do it on VHF. So therefore, the answer to this question is all of the above are correct. Let's go, let's continue. What is another name for a WinLink remote message server, right? So that's the RMS server. What's another name for it? It's sometimes also called, more popularly, a gateway. Okay, so you're connecting to a gateway. When you use WinLink Express or RMS Express software and you tell your radio connect or start, what your radio is going to try to do is connect to a gateway on RMS. Right, which of the following is a way to establish contact with a digital messaging system gateway station? Well, what you do is you use the software and then you go and transmit on the station's published frequency. Right, so as you go to connect, you just look up in the directory and it will list the frequencies that that station is listening on. Right, so essentially the RMS Express or the Winning Express software carry a directory of stations with the gateway stations and the frequencies they operate also other things such as the protocol as well as the time of operations and so on question what is vara so we did say vara is one of the other protocols that you can use we talked about using pacto we also mentioned you can use telnet over the internet but vara is another protocol that you can use so therefore vara is a digital protocol used with winlink what symptoms may result from other signals interfering with a PACTA or VARA transmission? So you're using WinLink, you're doing either PACTA or VARA, and then you find that you're not able to communicate. Um, you know, some other signal is interfering with you, but how can you tell? What are the symptoms? Firstly, you may have frequent retries or timeouts. You may also have long pauses in message transmissions. And lastly, you may have a complete failure to establish a connection between the stations altogether, you may not connect. So all of these are possible symptoms if there's something that's interfering with your signals uh, when you try to communicate using WinLink on Pacto or Varo. How do you join a contact between two stations using the Pacto protocol? How do you join a contact? So in other words, there are two stations communicating and you want to make it a third. Uh, well, two is a company, three is a crowd. So you cannot do that in um, the Pacto protocol or using the Pacto protocol. It's one to one. 
you can only communicate with a station after they've completed, right? So you, you cannot somehow interrupt and, you know, join on a party line and somehow get involved in that communication. It's a one-to-one. -one. So therefore, the answer is joining an existing contact is not possible. Factor connections are limited to two stations. What is the primary purpose of an amateur radio emergency data network or RDN? mesh network what's the primary purpose the primary purpose is to provide high-speed data services during an emergency or during a community event so basically hams have access to high-speed communication links that they could send messages they could transfer information and uh, all sorts of things you can even uh, route the internet over it as well for hams you just have to be careful that uh, an unlicensed person is not using the network all right so a couple of safety questions. What is one way that the RF energy can affect human body tissue? So we did say that it can heat up our body tissue. And that's how we can get burns. Next question. Which of the following is used to determine RF exposure from a transmitted signal? All right, let's dissect this question. Which of the following is used to do what? To determine RF exposure. So. RF, expo RF exposure is from what? A transmitted signal. So we have our radio frequency transmission. We have radio going to our antenna via our feed line and we're transmitting. How do you determine the RF exposure? Well, all of these parameters or all of these are correct. The duty cycle, we said the higher the duty cycle, the more exposure. The frequency, and we did show a graph that shows that specific frequencies um, will uh, expose you to more danger as well as the amount of power you run, so that's the power density. So these all are correct, that determines your RF exposure. Which of the following, sorry, I say again, what is the effect of modulation duty cycle on RF exposure? So again, this modulation duty cycle, really duty cycle of our transmission, right? What effect does it have on RF exposure? Well, the lower duty cycle allows you or permits low greater power levels to be transmitted. So the lower the duty cycle, you can run higher power. That's what it's actually saying. Of course, it, the corollary, the opposite is also true. The higher the duty cycle, that means your power needs to be reduced. Again, see why it's important to become a trained amateur radio operator. You don't want to shoot yourself in the foot or cause harm to your neighbors, friends, and family, right? So we're learning all of this theory so that we can be safe. Safety is important. Safety first. Next question in question pool. What does time averaging mean when evaluating RF radiation exposure? So time averaging is a definition that we need to learn for the exam. And what it means is the total RF exposure averaged over a certain period. So we have to look at how much RF you're exposed to over a time. What precautions should be taken if you install an, an, an indoor antenna? I say again, install an indoor transmitting antenna. What precaution should you take? Well, if you do that, you have to make sure that the maximum power um, exposure limits or maximum permissible exposure limits are not exceeded in the occupied areas. Next question. What stations are subject to the FCC rules on RF exposure? Let's dissect this question. What are they asking? What stations? In other words, what criteria do you have to meet to make you the subject of the FCC rules that deals with RF exposure. In other words, who does it apply to? It applies to all stations with a time average transmission of more than one milliwatt. So as long as your time average transmission um, is greater than one milliwatt, then you need to conduct an RF exposure evaluation and you fall within the rules of the FCC in relation to RF exposure. Next question in the question pool, which of the following steps must an amateur operator take to ensure compliance with RF safety regulations? So in order to make sure that you are in compliance with your RF safety regulations, you need to perform a routine RF exposure evaluation and prevent access to any identified high exposure areas. So you're conducting an RF exposure evaluation. But how do we do that is the subject of the next question. How can you determine that your station complies with the FCC RF exposure regulations? How? 
Well, all of these are in fact correct. You do so by calculation based on the FCC OET Bulletin 65. We'll try to share that with the class subsequently. Also a calculation based on computer modeling. So that's using software or a website. And also you can measure directly using a field strength meter, right? So it needs to be calibrated as well, that field strength meter. Uh, therefore, all of these choices are correct for that exam question. A couple more. What type of instrument can be used to accurately measure an RF field strength? It's a calibrated field strength meter with a calibrated antenna. Calibrated, calibrated, calibrated. All right. What must you do if your station fails to meet the FCC RF exposure exemption criteria? Right. So remember the exemption criteria is low power stations, right? So if you do not meet that criteria, you need to perform an RF exposure evaluation in accordance with the FCC OET Bulletin 65. As long as you're not running low power, you need to do an uh, evaluation. So folks, um, I think we just have one more, a uh, couple more questions. Let's, let's continue. What must you do if an evaluation of your station shows that the RF energy radiated by a station exceeds the permissible limits for possible human absorption. What are they asking us? What must you do if you exceed the RF energy um, beyond the MPE? Well, you need to take action to prevent human exposure to the excessive RF fields, right? So take any and any legal means necessary to prevent that exposure. Next question in question pool, what should be done if evaluation shows that a neighbor might experience more than the allowable limit of RF exposure from the main lobe of a directional antenna. What are they asking us? You're using a Yagi, you're using a directional antenna, and you may point it in the direction of a neighbor. And, you know, when you do your evaluation, you realize that neighbor will be exposed to RF above the exposure limits. What must you do? Well, you must take the precautions to ensure that the antenna cannot be pointed in that direction when they are present. Okay. All right. Final couple of questions, folks. And thank you very much for seeing the extra time. Which of the following, I say again, which of these choices should be observed when climbing a tower using a safety harness? So we talk about tower safety and using a safety harness. What should you pay attention to? Firstly, you confirm that the harness is rated for the weight of the climber and also that it is within its allowable service life. In other words, it has not gone beyond its expiry date. What should be done before climbing a tower that supports electrically powered devices? So again, we did say there can be rotors and other electrical equipment on the tower and you're going to send somebody up the tower, you're going to go up the tower, what, what, what must you do? Well, you need to make sure that all circuits that supply power to the tower are locked out and tagged out. In other words, de-energize it and make sure that someone cannot inadvertently re-energize it. Okay. I mean, you don't want to electrocute the person that's climbing the tower. Okay, why should solder joints not be used in lightning protection ground connections? Why? because a solder joint will likely be destroyed by the heat of a lightning strike. So again, don't use solder and ground connections. And our last question for this evening is, which of the following is required for lightning protection ground rods? So once you have grounding and you have multiple ground rods, you need to bond them or connect them together. So the answer is they must be bonded together with all of the grounds. So folks, let's just uh, wrap up our slideshow on a slide deck. So again, today we have been covering pages 118 to 122. We are really running a piece. Thank you for everyone who stayed the extra time. This is our trusty slide that gives a reference between HF, VHF, UHF, the various amateur radio bands when you become licensed that we have access to. And of course you have sub bands inside of there. So a very um, handy chart to have. Uh, again, we are coming to you live from Orlando, Hamcation 2024, and we, again, appreciate all of the persons who were here with us that may be tuned in as well. And, of course, Trinidad and Tobago, it's a carnival, a fantastic Friday. We thank you so much for being part of this evening's session. If you have any questions, feel free to do so 
via email at this email address, robbie at 9y4r.com, or you can send a WhatsApp to my mobile number, 1868-682-2212. Again, we also send out uh, periodic um, information such as the upcoming session, date time, and the Zoom link. Feel free to join this WhatsApp channel. We also share other information that could be of interest to amateur radio operators, things like weather and lightning and Saharan dust and so on. Um, so feel free to join this channel. You can share it as well for anyone that will be so interested. So folks, uh, God's willing, our next session will be next week, Friday, the 16th of February, 2024, at the usual time, 8.30 p.m. Atlantic Standard Time. So thank you very much, especially for staying on the extra time. And we will see you next week. So everyone be safe. Take good care. Have a good night.